to my chat uh, in the exquisite Culinary Cannabis Cooking Expo. Um, for those of you who know me and for those of you who don't, my name's Andrew Friedman. I'm known as the Cannabis Sommelier. I do cannabis fine dining events internationally with amazing, amazing chefs. I also have a YouTube channel that really started everything on the YouTube channel. I teach cannabis and wine pairings, how to cocktail with cannabis, cannabis and craft beer pairings, uh, cannabis recipes, and also tons and tons of cannabis reviews. I invented the 100 point scale to grading cannabis. So you can find all of that on my YouTube channel, The Cannabis Sommelier. In the world of wine, because I am an actual wine guy, I am a WSET Level 3 um, Wine and Spirit Education Trust Level 3, as well as one of few Canadian wine scholars. Why I wanted to become a Canadian wine scholar was because I saw cannabis law really paralleling alcohol law as I saw prohibition ending in Canada uh, for cannabis. I saw a lot of that law being copied so I figured you know I should become an expert. Some of the things that I uncovered were really cool that really our greatest growing regions for wine in Canada are also our best cannabis growing regions who would have thought. As I dove deeper and deeper and deeper into the world of wine I really um, started to understand that cannabis and wine are almost an identical product. When we think about it from an agricultural standpoint, we're taking a strain specific varietal, we're introducing it to a specific microclimate, and then we're growing something that has smells and flavors and intoxication. But it's so much more to that, more than that. When we think about a grape and we think about a trichome head, our grape contains terpenes, flavonoids, water, and our grape skin. Our trichome head has terpenes, flavonoids, cannabinoids, and our waxy cuticle. The only difference between these two circles is that one needs to be fermented to have an intoxicating effect, where the other needs to be decarboxylated to have an intoxicating effect. Very, very similar. And when we look at the Venn diagram of both of them, it really becomes apparent that cannabis, just like wine, is all about a person, a place, and a moment. We see so often that year on a wine bottle. Not many of us ever take the time to consider what that year really meant. We think about 2018 in the Okanagan and the forest fires and the smoke. We think about 2020 in California, uh, Oregon, Washington, and the crazy fire season that we've had this year. And to think about how much land was actually destroyed, how much less wine is there, we can really start relating these things back to cannabis. The incredibly passionate people that go to these extreme lengths just to chase their passion. I always like to say there's a fine line between passion and obsession and I'm very lucky that I become obsessed and I think like a lot of my peers in the cannabis world, we found a hobby that we could be obsessed with and really turn it into a business. And those same people apply in wine and in cannabis. Obsessive people looking to change the narrative of what we have. When we think about a place, my very first day in wine class, my teacher asked, you know, what other agricultural product has over 150 uh, specific strains that are varietal indicative of where they're growing? And I put up my hand and I said, cannabis, of course. And everybody in the class laughed at me. And I thought that was ridiculous. And afterwards, uh, the teacher, who's a prominent wine figure in Calgary, Alberta, where I'm from, came up and said, you know, I'm gonna stop asking that question because you're right. And I replied, yeah, you know, I know I'm right. That's why I decided to come take a wine class. And really how the idea of the cannabis sommelier was born. The cannabis sommelier, Andrew Friedman, why, why I made it all was really to just create an easier parallel for people. Wine is seen as such a collectible connoisseur item that's for, you know, the, uh, everyone from the pretentious and the eloquent and the intelligent and like, you know, people, wine is very romanticized. It's, it's collected, it's expensive, it's something that you need to learn about to know. And for me, I saw cannabis as the exact same thing. Without deep knowledge, I would never know. Without, you know, training my nose and my palate, I would never be able to smell and explain flavors and blind taste the same way that I did in wine. Just the reality was, 
there isn't an accreditation for cannabis. Not yet, at least. Obviously, of course, I'm sure some of us are working on it. Um, but that's why wine was important. Thank God for those drunken monks and the Holy Crusades uh, with nothing better to do than write about why one row of wine was better than the other, what it tasted like and smelled like, and why God was great. Because it must have been terribly boring back then. Uh, our plague this year, I couldn't even have imagined, you know, <laughs> the Black Plague and what those monks were doing to fill their time. And so we have this amazing history of wine, but we don't have this amazing history of cannabis. And that's really why wine has gotten to this moment. Uh, you know, we can we can trace wine back 2000 AD to the Epic of Gilgamesh is the first time it's written about. We can trace cannabis back to Egyptian and ancient Chinese tombs that predate that Epic of Gilgamesh. So when we're really thinking about what has a longer recorded history, it should be cannabis. But for some reason, throughout the ages, cannabis was forgotten about as an intoxicant. Now, luckily, we're in this realm where we have legalization, we're seeing global markets emerge, and finally, cannabis is being looked at as an ingredient again. But there's definitely a long way to go. Um, we don't have lounges, right? We don't have cannabis restaurants. And obviously, um, well, in Canada, where I am, uh, cannabis and wine are not to be matched. So it's very interesting that we're on a digital platform right now, because if I was in person, I wouldn't actually be able to pontificate about the things that I would like to right now on a public platform because of the fact that it is uh, pairing wine and cannabis. Now through this digital context, it's not the same. Because I'm at my house, I'm not making any suggestions nor telling you that you should do this. I'm just going to explain some of the science for educational purposes and how you might do it and how to explore it because this is really where I think we're going to find benefit and value and what's super important. And so I've learned quite a bit um, through these years of pairing cannabis and wine. I've been fortunate to throw, you know, probably 30 uh, decent scale events, um, do hundreds and hundreds of tasting notes for cannabis, blind tasting notes, uh, thousands for wine, and come to a point where I've really started to find some very familiar themes uh, in cannabis and in wine which is very cool. Once you can look past wine as alcohol and stop smelling that alcohol, it's got such an amazing depth of complexity that expresses so much, tells you a story of a, of a place and a time, and that's why blind tasting wine is so cool. But we can definitely do the same thing in cannabis as long as we arm ourselves with enough knowledge and expertise to really um, be able to take these slight notions of smell and taste and deduce them back to an educated guess. Because really when we're blind tasting, we're, we're always just guessing. But today we're going to pair. Uh, and pairing is cool. When you think about a dining event, you know, the reality is you're probably gonna have a beverage with your dinner. Regardless if you drink alcohol or not, um, I think mocktails are a very big part of it. And we're gonna talk about cannabis infused non-alcoholic cocktails after the wine pairing side. But everybody really is looking at having a dining experience completed with beverage. Nobody wants to go for a nice dinner and just drink water. Unless you do, then that's fine. No judging. But for the majority of us, there are only so many things that can elevate that dining experience. And um, the one of the most massive ones is beverage. And obviously alcoholic beverage. You know, maybe I'll answer a quick question for everyone. Is that why should I drink red wine when I eat steak? The question that's, uh, you know, been around for ages. And it's a very, very simple answer. And why pairing of wine and food works. When we eat meat, there are these protein strings in meat, um, the grittiness of meat. In wine, we also have these strings, these tannic strings. And when you've drank red wine or tea and you get that feeling of fuzzy slippers in your mouth, kind of um, not bitter, but drying, that's, that's tannin. Think about drinking cold tea and how it dries your mouth. That's, that's tannin. And tannin is found in red wine. That's it from the skin. The skins are what hold all the, uh, most of the flavor and, and the tannin. And so when you're eating red meat, 
you have that protein string and then you have that tannic string and they like to bind together and it makes this string longer. And so when you have this longer protein string, the tannin and the protein feel smoother and softer on your palate and in your mouth. And there's the science of why you should drink red wine with red meat. Now, when it comes to smoke, it's obviously a lot harder. Um, when I think about pairing cannabis and wine, it really works very well on the nose. On the palate, it works quite well as long as we're vaporizing. As soon as we get into a world where we start smoking cannabis, it does become a little bit more complicated. Smoke is drying, it's, it's very uh, pungent. But if I was going to suggest one thing, just to, before we dive into it, it's that if I am pairing smoked cannabis, I'm pairing it with red wine um, because I find, again, that that tannic structure actually lengthens with the smoke. Sometimes, not all the time, some smoke makes the alcohol fly through the roof, um, but I do love a juicy carbonic macerated gamay uh, with, you know, a wonderful smoke, something OG and cushy is always very, very nice. Well, let's dive into what cannabis wine pairing should be. Um, we've got some bubbles, woo woo. We have Maison Rosier, Blanquette de Limon. Uh, this is like Blanc de Blanc Chardonnay in a traditional method, but not made in Champagne. Um, quite a nice bottle, 12% alcohol. So when you have Chardonnay, uh, you know, and a Blanc de Blanc, you know that the acid's gonna be higher. Uh, your general champagne grapes are Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. The Pinot Noir bringing a bit more uh, roundness and fruitiness where your uh, Chardonnay, pff, tons of acid, tons of citrus, bangers. And you know, I really like those kind of bangers for when we're pairing. Uh, the kind of the more pronounced you can get in one direction, makes life very easy, especially when you're relating it for people. You know, if I can say anything, this tastes like sour green apple, and I can bring that into cannabis and make it very easy and relatable, it's much better than, you know, talking about uh, lemon rind, uh, Sicilian lemon rind pith, uh, and, and all these ridiculous um, little bits that the, us wine nerds like to get into. But let's pop this, I'm sorry if it goes bang, these stoppers tend to do that, uh, the trapped CO2 is, you know. Um, but if you don't have one of these at home, you don't have to drink a whole bottle of bubbles in one go. You get one of these champagne stoppers, they're good for like five days, which makes it a lot better because we as North Americans are really good at thinking we should only drink bubbles for celebration, when the reality is if you asked uh, Madame Boulanger, Lady Boulanger, uh, a glass of champagne every day is the key to uh, a long life. So. I like that side. Uh, let's see if this bangs, I hope it doesn't. Not bad, can you see the smoking gun? Oh yeah. Smells beautiful in the room, uh, green apple. This is an international standard size tasting glass. If you were a wine guy in anywhere in wine, this is the, this is the tasting glass you use. Wonderful, this is a great bubble. About a $55 bottle, I believe. So, on the nose, it has those indicative, I'm gonna do a wine uh, tasting quick so that you know what I'm tasting. On the nose, it's quite indicative of uh, traditional method. And when we talk about traditional method, we're talking about uh, invented by the Monk Dom Perignon, uh, trapping fermentation in the bottle, you have your still wine, you add more sugar, you start a second fermentation, you trap it in there, and then your byproducts are heat and CO2, the CO2 gets trapped, and my CO2 is my bubble right there. So you, from that traditional method, you can smell a bit of that breadiness, a bit of the, a bit of the yeast, the lees, the dead yeast cells, but on top of that, it's a beautiful lemon, it's green apple, it's a bit of like kind of key lime. It's a really nice Blanc de Blanc. But then you can smell the oak and the woodiness and uh, it's French oak, so it is slight. American oak has double the spices, but uh, oak tends to add baking spices. A Little bit of vanilla in there. Just that little, little bit of wood rounds it out nice. It makes it complex. It makes it have 
that bit of sweetness on the nose. I should mention again that this is Brut. Brut is your driest champagne, where dry is actually the sweetest. Extra dry being in the middle. So driest in terms of table wine, least amount of sugar, Brut. Extra dry, dry. Just to confuse you, because when we talk about a table wine, a red or a white, a dry wine would be without sugar, but backwards in champagne. So we have a Brut. The bubble's nice. It's not a big bubble. It's quite a fine bubble that really snaps nicely and closes. It doesn't explode on my palate. When you get those really explosive bubbles, that's often from CO2 injected bubbles, whereas your traditional method have a very nice fine petulance. You know, the, the, the palate definitely matches the nose. It leads with Sicilian lemon and then it's like a nice sour green apple skin. It's a little bit of key lime. It's got a little bit of residual sweetness. Um, small dosage. Dosage being the sugar you would add in to start that second fermentation and how much actually gets used up. But it's a nice wine, very round. Um, a good example of Blanc de Blanc traditional method. So I think this will pair well with the cannabis that I've chosen today. And I'll explain why I chose the cannabis. Mm. Cheers. Mm. Speaking of that, we should have a little puff too. 15 minutes in, this is your uh, this is your puff break. Cheers. There we go. All right, so the cannabis I've chosen is some lemon cookies. And I grew this lemon cookies. I guess I could have grabbed a fuller jar, but this one had big nugs. Certified dank, there you go. Sticker on top. Wah. So, this is lemon cookies. I got this from a cut from a friend. Uh, no idea what the lineage is, kind of a bad name, but it is true to its name. It has some good confectionery notes, uh, some cakey, kind of sweet bready notes, and it as well has that nice lemon. So if we're thinking about an easy pairing and how we could do it well, we've got sweet, bready, lemon, sour apple, and we've got slightly cakey, sweet, bready, lemon. Sounds like, it, excuse me, it should elevate what's going on in our wine. And when the, when the wine and cannabis become perfect together, it's an explosive combination. Like, absolutely epic. Uh, I'm not gonna do it on the palate. Actually, I am, because I'll warm up one of these vaporizers. I didn't think about that, but I'll warm up a vaporizer right now so that we can do a, a pairing on the palate as well. I like this freestyle. See if we can get it out. There we go. Okay. So the nose is really where the massive pairing happens. And we can we can confuse our nose very easy. So for the experiment, um, if everybody's playing along, you know, go get yourself a glass of wine. Ooh, and get yourself some buds and grab two wine glasses, preferably the same size. I have two standardized tasting glasses. And let's just get some nugs out of here. Again, this is home growing goodness. I know this cannabis very well. Some nice nugs, nug stash. Ooh, hope you're having a good day. Um, let's not use the big ones though, because they might not go in the jar as easy, but I got everything else in there and we're just gonna pour it in like so. Ooh, it's spilling everywhere. Sorry, sorry team. But I don't want to leave my cannabis out exposed to the air too long because I'm definitely trying to get all of those nice cured aromas. Of course, there's not the best trimmed buds down there at the bottom. Oh. Okay, so we have our cannabis in a glass. Again, ooh, sniff and swirl. Cheers. So. We've already gone through our wine, we've done our wine uh, sniff. We know what the wine tastes like, what it smells like. It's very important in my process that you learn the wine first before the cannabis, because the cannabis tends to be quite pungent sometimes, where wine can be quite simple sometimes. So important to learn your wine, smell your wine, taste your wine, memorize your wine first. And if you need to do that quick, mm, smells like I remember. Tastes better than I remember. Awesome, love that acid of Blanc de Blanc. Now, our cannabis, let's check out our cannabis. 
So quite hairy cannabis. Could have done a better trim on these little bottoms, but that's okay. Let's give it the old sniffy sniff because in my world, the nose knows. If we were talking about my 100 point scale of grading cannabis, it's 20 points for appearance, 40 points for the nose because the nose knows, 20 points for taste, and then 20 points on your overall impression based on your knowledge of cannabis. There it is. So it's got, it's like, like I've grown this cannabis quite a bit. So I know it's sweet bread, it's lemon. It's kind of a bit of cat piss. And it's like, almost like the smell of a wet, fresh dirt, because it is quite fresh cannabis. Harvested about 60 days ago and been curing for 45. So we, get, we've, we now know our cannabis smell. Lemon, sweet bread, kind of pee pee. Now, let's take our wine. Wow, and see, it's already changed. And so because I have, this is my olfactory reflex. Right here in my sinuses, your olfactory is where all of these smells are really happening. And I should explain quickly before I go any further that we can only taste five things. Sour, sweet, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami being like mushroom. But we can smell millions and millions and millions of combinations of anything. Our smell is our memory. Our smell are related to all of these moments. They're all very unique and particular to us in our lives. So whenever you go to a wine tasting and somebody's like, oh, it smells like this, and you're like, no, it smells like this. Whatever it smells like to you is, is, is what it should smell like to you. Doesn't mean that you're right, but we all have our specific memories based on how aromas have been built. So back to it. Um, what I found there was it crushed out a ton of the lemon and lime from the wine and I was able to smell the sweetness massively, but I'm going to go back into the cannabis and then do that. And, and the way that I do the process is how I'd like to see you doing it. And you're really going to confuse your senses. You're going to confuse in your olfactory reflex and you're going to see what this combination of smells is. Cause when we think about terpenes and terpenes are an aerosol, they're always oxidizing they're always evaporating so we get these aerosols in our nose from our cannabis and our wine and then we're confusing those aromas and that's the essence of a cannabis and wine pairing lemon pea sweet and now it's just all oak yeast breadiness becomes much more simple. And then back to the cannabis, it's much cakier. It's, it's, it is that Girl Scout cookies that we all imagine without the lemon. So really what it's done here is take away that citrus zing and make it very sweet, very almost unctuous in its idea of sweetness that for me is like okay andy where are you gonna go with this dessert you're thinking about some really bright acid dessert or maybe something even with a little bit of spice that would play against the sweetness and then the acid that's happening here oh man as i think about it i'm like <sighs> lemon meringue pie would be too much acid but if we can think about that meringue with a little bit toned down pie filling and that pie crust, like those are all the same kind of aromas I'm getting here. And that would be just absolutely excellent. Um, oh man. Yeah, like a banana cream pie or a banana meringue pie with the lemon cookies and the Blanc de Blanc traditional method would be absolutely killer. So I'm gonna load up the vape while I talk a little bit more and we'll see how this changes on my palate as well. And then uh, we're 25 minutes in, so I'll chat for a little bit longer and, uh, and then I'll get, get out of here. But it's been great chatting with everyone. Um, if you're trying to connect with me in any way, please just send me a DM on Instagram, The Cannabis Psalm. I'm on YouTube, The Cannabis Sommelier. My emails, thecannabissom at gmail.com, uh, website, thecannabissom.com. Please feel free to reach out. I am 
extremely responsive and always happy to help. If we don't collaborate and, and uh, work together, then we'll, we will be stagnant in what we all collectively want. All right, let's fire this up. I got the, uh, this is the Stores and Bickle Mighty, so uh, the, I guess the kind of little brother of the Volcano Vape. And we're gonna set it to 342 Fahrenheit. Perfect, and I'll leave that until it heats up when we hear it buzz. But the things that I wanted to talk about were just cocktail, cannabis cocktail. Now, cannabis cocktail doesn't necessarily be need to be alcoholic. A cocktail is an amazing beverage that was crafted artisanally, and although our only intoxicant that we've had up until this moment is alcohol, obviously cannabis can be that ingredient for us if we're cocktailing. You can create so many amazing things, and I think it's super important to think about non-alcoholic cocktails, even as the dining world progresses, as more people look forward to that California sober, that no, no drinking or very light drinking, but still wanna be part of those social interactions. We all need to be very cognizant of the reality that uh, you know maybe alcohol isn't for everyone. And so that's why I see cocktail, and especially cannabis cocktail, as such an important bridge. Because this is a moment where we can have amazing crafted beverages with cannabis, without, with or without alcohol, that can really start creating that bridge for somebody who likes that beverage, but maybe isn't a huge wine drinker or a beer drinker in general, but again, is feeling left out of that dining experience. I know I've seen a huge push for zero proof cocktails, no alcohol cocktails in the last few years, and a lot of great companies like Seedlip developing uh, non-alcoholic distilled spirits that are really utilizing terpenes in them. So another route where cannabis could also come into play, I've made some amazing uh, cocktails with terpenes and those terpenes are very interesting how they have bittering agents and spice and heat because they have been distilled they sometimes can create interesting replications of what uh you know what booze does it'll never be perfect it'll never have that burn but um okay i'm heated up i'm gonna do a little pairing here so i'm just gonna sip my wine wonderful and then let's have a puff and see how it changes my palate What's well, quite light, I might turn it up to 350. When I vape, I always get a lot of those floral aromas, nice earthy aromas. The lemon comes through, cakiness comes through. Actually, on the vape, it tastes very, very uh, similar to, to what I smelled. Let's turn it up a little bit hotter. There we go, now I see some vapor. Very floral, very nice, which again, should add beautifully to bubbles. I love bubbles for pairing. They're they're very easy to pair with. They, they really like to take cannabis, especially sweeter cannabis. Beautiful, ah, wow, actually an incredible pairing. So it adds uh, a, a great layer of like flower, flowers, like potpourri almost to the wine, but then it candied the lemon. The lemon became so much more like after you get past the sour part of a lemon head to the, the sweetness of the lemon head. Wow, great pairing, totally changed it. Didn't actually expect it to be that dramatic. Gorgeous. I also find it takes away a bit of the bubble, the sour apple. It's definitely making more sweetness and also like almost highlighting like a slatiness that might have come from the terroir. Yeah, like a, the minerality is pounding out of it now on the back palate, which is great. This was a killer pairing. Lemon cookies, Blanc de Blanc. Uh, we'll do this one again. Wow. Anyways, enough about me and the pairing. You see how it goes now. You see the process. Pour myself some more wine. Worked, works great. 
So, a successful wine pairing. I'm glad I ended the video there. Who knows how much it skipped out at, because as I'm learning, DSLRs only run for uh, 25, 26 minutes, might have gone 29. I guess we'll find out. I'll stitch it together, see what happens, but really for me, my idea is that the future of beverage can incorporate with cannabis. If we can start seeing the utilization of cannabis refined terpenes in beverage with specific mixes used almost like bitters, if we can see cocktail and even alcohol laws just evolve so that we can have places where ideas like the idea I'm presenting for you can be presented publicly, that'll be huge. As the world normalizes cannabis, cannabis beverage will become normalized and this is really the easiest way for me to think about normalization. We see so many replicated cannabis beverages coming out now looking like beers, looking like wine, the Molo 5, the Rebel Coast wineries of the world. And it means that the consumer actually doesn't want to drink alcohol but would like to have some kind of intoxication. Or does it mean somebody just wants something in their hand, they just want a beverage and they just want to get fucked up. Excuse my French. Um, probably the reality. But it's cool to me to be on the forefront really exploring all of these things, challenging the status quo, and looking for answers that make sense. When I think about the idea that alcohol and cannabis shouldn't be mixed, I would also then go and ask the cannabis consumer. Obviously, uh, mixing anything isn't great for anybody. Alcohol isn't great, cannabis isn't great for anyone. Mixing the two, obviously not. But when we talk to cannabis consumers and we talk to alcohol consumers, the majority of them have a story about consuming one or the other while consuming one or the other. And it's important that we can just set standards for this type of consumption. If I'm not able to be certified and have my expertise used as my duty of care, my responsibility to make sure that you are safe, then how can we ever move forward? Obviously, we're in the very infancy of what cannabis legalization is and can be. We haven't even seen the Cannabis Act be uh, revised in 2023 yet. We're, you know, 26 months into legalization and things are moving in the right direction really quickly. But what I'm super excited for is for them to move in the direction that I want them to move in, which is food and beverage so that we can normalize cannabis consumption in these dining atmospheres the way that we're all extremely used to. I think that's my moment to leave. If you want to chat with me, I think I have a breakout room going on. If you have any questions, follow up. Uh, thecannabissom.com has all my contact forms. Thecannabissom at gmail.com. Thecannabissomali on YouTube. Thecannabissom, basically anywhere else on the internet that there is social media. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen, watch, learn about wine pairings, and I look forward to chatting again. All the best. Cheers. What's my name? What's my name? The Cannabis Somalier